Assistant Secretary from Cuba. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I'd like to start off um, just with a couple of short apologies. Firstly, from our Deputy Secretary General, Fleury Teo, who was invited to talk um, at this conference today and unfortunately is tied up with other meetings in Suva, so he passes on his apologies. And secondly, I have a, a brief apology to those of you who I know were in the audience a couple of days ago where I presented a few of these same slides talking about the Pacific Plan Review. Um, but I hope you'll be heartened to know that there are a couple of points of difference today. Um, a key one being that we actually have a member of the Pacific Plan Review team in our midst, um, Ms. Numia Sami, who's at the back there. So I, I hope if there are any thorny questions about the review, Numia will be there to help me out or, or to pull me up if I get anything wrong. Um, as for the introduction, I'm, I'm from the Forum Secretariat, and we've been given the role of uh, managing and, and assisting with the Pacific Plan Review, but it is an independent process. Um, and so what I'd like to do today is just highlight some of the findings that the team has released and made public thus far, um, noting that we'll hear more from them in about a month's time when they put out their draft report, which will have a lot more details about some of the initial proposals. Um, I should also point out that this topic of the future of Pacific regionalism was one that it, we were given by, by the ANU to talk to, and it does seem a rather lofty topic, but I think actually the Pacific Plan Review is a really good lens through which to look towards the future of Pacific regionalism, whilst also looking a little bit at the past. Um, so to begin, I, I don't want to go very um, far into the past, because in fact the Pacific Plan itself is a relatively young document. Um, and Again, I, I have shown this before, and people are, should be very familiar with this leader's vision, which was issued in, in 2004. Um, it feels perhaps a little back to the future, because at that time, they were talking very much about this future vision for the region, um, which I think is, is held solid over, over the intervening years. Um, it was really supposed to be the foundation on which the Pacific Plan was based. So the, the year following, the Pacific Plan was, was put together and endorsed by leaders. Um, it was based at the time on some studies that were actually done by the Asian Development Bank and, and the Commonwealth, um, which looked into options for pooling service provision and, and various forms of regionalism. Um, and when it first came out, it was a perhaps a little unwieldy document. It, it had about 44 initiatives that were listed in its annexes as um, areas of regional cooperation and integration that could be pursued by Pacific Island countries. Um, over the, the subsequent years, those initiatives or priorities were updated on a regular basis until we got to about 2009 uh, and a medium um, term set of priorities were identified. But as you'll see, they weren't trimmed very much. We got to 37 and those are still the priorities that are in place in the Pacific Plan. Um, and this is one of the issues that will be or is being addressed in, in the current review is you know, really what are our priorities as a region? And in particular, how can we focus on priorities for regional cooperation and integration? So to give you a sense of um, perhaps what's different about this review from past reviews, and I know that we also have in our midst uh, people who have a lot of experience in the region and have seen a number of reviews um, being undertaken perhaps not only on the Pacific plan, but on the entire regional architecture um, for the Pacific and, and reviews of the Pacific Forum, Islands Forum Secretariat. Um, and one thing that we think is a, a point of difference with this review, we, we hope, is that it's led by an eminent person from the region, Sir McCary, um, and he has a very strong team with him. We have two country officials who have been there in support uh, and two international consultants who have actually been brought on to help in producing the review's outputs as well. And this team has been given a, a very large task. They've been asked not only to look at the Pacific Plan as a document, but actually to think more broadly about the context in which the Pacific Plan is situated. Um, and as has been alluded to in the previous session, that context has really changed. Even over the, the short few years since the Pacific Plan was first implemented, we've seen the rise of, of sub-regionalism. We've seen the change in the international agenda and a number of um, agreements that the Pacific has signed up to or issues on which uh, shared stance has been taken. And there's been pressure on the Pacific plan to, to really take that role of, of helping to present a shared platform for the Pacific. And at the same time, there's been pressure from the national level to align with a lot of national development plans and show how that these objectives that are outlined in the, at a regional level also relate to community and national levels. 
So the team has been really asked to look at that, that whole broad context and really think about governance issues um, as well as, as the wording of the plan itself. They've been rather busy in the, in the few months that they've been on the job. Um, from January to May this year, they travelled around all of our uh, foreign member countries and our two associate members, so 18 countries in total. Um, and throughout those consultations, they were meeting with politicians. They were actually here at ANU a couple of months ago and, and held a, um, a consultation with academics. They've been meeting with other regional organisations. They've been meeting with civil society groups, so really trying to canvas a whole range of voices. Of course, they haven't been able to speak with everyone, and, and they've tried to uh, hear a little more by inviting public submissions. And I know that in the end we've received over 70, um, and although that public submissions process is now officially closed, they've generously said that if there are some more pressing issues that people want to convey to them, that they'll, they'll hear those. Um, and in particular, if there are issues that are responding to the documents, the review notes that the team has already put out. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, the, the team is due to come back to us at the end of, of next month and, and certainly in time for the Pacific Plan Action Committee meeting in early August with their draft report, um, which we think will provide some more detail on their interim findings, which I'd like to touch on now. Um, one of the, the key findings that the, the team have presented was well, in, the, in the presentation at, um, which was given in Suva at the end of May, was really focusing on the region that they found during their consultations. And a lot of this isn't, isn't new material, but it's really important to hear and to reflect back um, because it was really what was amalgamated from all the, the stories and the voices that they heard. So, of course, there was a recognition of the diversity of the region, of, of connections between people at the same time as fragmentation. But what I really like to focus on here was um, the sense that there was an ongoing appetite for regionalism that, that did come through from all the consultations. Um, but also there was a diversity of opinion on, on what regionalism meant and, and really if it was a journey that we were on and it was a long-term journey, where exactly that journey was going to. Um, the team talked a little bit about a spectrum of regional cooperation through to integration and emphasised that the Pacific region is very much at the cooperation end of that spectrum at this stage. Um, and they felt that the current Pacific plan really wasn't the document that we needed to take us forward into that next stage. We need some changes. They proposed that, um, and again we'll see more, more uh, details on this soon, but that what we needed was a new Pacific framework. Um, something that shouldn't be seen as a really comprehensive regional development plan that was all about a, an integrated region. Um, and also something that shouldn't be all about listing priorities for, for donors to, to come in and fund, but should be much more capturing the essence of what countries were really keen to work on, um, perhaps at, at the level more of pooling and cooperation than at the, the heavily integrated level. Um, they also talked a lot about creating a space for po political dialogue on these issues and the importance of actually giving leaders um, that opportunity to sit and discuss and, and create a collegial atmosphere in which they could identify the areas in which they really saw the most promise in working together and were then open to, to all the suggestions that were put up to them for the, the most viable economic and, and political options. Um, I think it might be good to, to note there too that um, there would be, need to be some changes in the existing regional architecture that we have in, in order to make this happen. Um, and the team did make some suggestions in that regard. They talked about the need for some gatekeeping on the kinds of issues that were put forward for, for leaders' consideration. As I mentioned earlier, at present we've got 37 priorities on the table. It's really too many. We need to think about um, how to trim that down and, and do that in a, a sensitive way. Um, and at the same time, not completely um, cut the fundament, fundamentals out of the Pacific plan. And some of those are things like the, the real values that the Pacific region wants to have expressed in this document. So I think they, they have a rather challenging task ahead of them in, in proposing what this future plan will look like, something that still captures the values but also is a lot more streamlined and is really going to give us a, a clear vision of what we need going forward. Um, thank you. So just to come back to the, the timeline for all of this, um, we'll see in September the, f the ending of this current review process when Sue McCary is going to meet with the, the region's leaders at their meeting in, in Marshall Islands. Um, but that certainly won't be the, the end of this journey. 
Uh, we hope that what the team will give us at that stage will be a lot of food for thought going forwards, but we will need a lot of engagement from, of course, from leaders and officials, um, but from a lot of different stakeholders in the region to help map out those next steps. I think when leaders asked the team to go out and perform this review, they called for a refreshed Pacific plan to be brought back to them. But I think what's been made clear is that we can't just set a team of, of even very um, talented consultants and officials and a, and a leader out and ask them to come back with a whole new plan for the Pacific. That plan actually has to be something that, that comes through from all of the, the member countries. Um, so what we're hoping is that they'll give us the document that will set out some next steps, but soon they won't be the end of the process. Uh, I'd just like to end by uh, giving you the URL for the, the team's uh, website. Um, I think it's important to, to have a look at that because they've been putting up all their documents as they go along and it's been a wonderfully transparent process. We've had all the submissions have been loaded up there as well as their review notes. I think up to this stage their, their full presentation that they gave in May is up there um, and we expect that there'll be a few more re review notes over the